Uh, first, let me all wel welcome you all to this book discussion. It's a wonderful um, opportunity to revisit our old and new themes. We are delighted especially to organize this book discussion as it deals with themes that have been central to the intellectual life of the center since its inception. For decades, politics and caste has been consistently debated and reconfigured, reformulated, and this has been possible because of the consistent internal debate that we have nourished at the center. We have uh, the author, of course, and the two distinguished speakers. Um, I would ask my colleague uh, Nishikan to introduce Anagha Ingole, the author of the book we are discussing, Caste Panchais and Caste Politics. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, welcome. Good, good evening. I think it, it may be a good morning for Professor Bilgrami, but for other it is good evening. Um, uh, uh, I have given a task to introduce Dr. Angha Ngole. Uh, I can introduce uh, her in two ways, as a dear friend and as a scholar. And for introducing as a scholar, let me be honest, I'm not prepared that. So I will introduce her as my dear friend who has been working together on uh, caste and other, uh, other different aspects of the caste. So Angha Ngole, I think she did her uh, master uh, an MPhil and PhD from you know, you know, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And I think then before she completed her PhD, she joined, uh, or maybe just after completion, she joined the Tripura University where I met her first, first time. And I remember uh, her, um, her paper, which was published in EPW on uh, ca caste and panchayat. And she was received the mail uh, from a publisher uh, that if she would she would like to convert it into a uh, book and she discussed with me also that the matter and I I very I was delighted to know and I said to her that she should grab that opportunity and uh, must write uh, must write this book and it it will be very useful in many ways and I remember uh, remember reading one of her book oh sorry one of her uh, essay uh, on the same topic and I send my some disagreement or maybe a uh, different of opinion. I, I don't remember uh, actually, but I, I did send her uh, my, uh, my comments on, um, on her book. And then she was, uh, uh, she was selected for the Ful Fulbright Fellowship and she was doing uh, work under uh, under supervision of the professor Bilgrami. And then I think that also she could not complete it and she joined back to the Hyderabad University. And she worked mostly on caste and she has some paper also on scavenging, uh, uh, mostly related to the issues, uh, issues related to caste and discrimination. And we did uh, work together when there was a, there was an issue of implementing um, roster at uh, taking un uh, uh, university as a unit or or as a as a department and i think that was the time when we uh, we i learned more about her and that was the first time i did some kind of activism apart from doing some okay so with this brief very very personal introduction i welcome angha and I hope uh, we will, will have a very fruitful discussion on this topic. Uh, thank you. Uh, now let me um, try to introduce the two distinguished speakers we have today. And we know that introducing them is not an easy task given the astound astounding range of range and nature of work that they have done and continue to do. Uh, Professor Gopal Guru is a political scientist, very well-known figure, um, and, his, uh, and his work is on political thought, politics, and uh, critical caste discourse. But what is interesting and most important is he has carved out a space of what, we can, what can be termed as existentialism in caste culture. And uh, currently, he's the editor of EPW. Uh, Prof. Akil Belgrami is a philosopher of language and mind, uh, dealing with concepts of self, moral psychology of politics, religion, um, described as a secularist and atheist. His ideas have a great bearing of think on thinking about a predicament on contemporary times. Currently, he's a, he's a professor of philosophy at Columbia University. Um, we, welcome, we, um, we welcome you to share your thoughts on the book, a uh, book that challenges common perceptions, 
misconceptions of caste politics, uh, the way in which it has uh, unleashed a pervasive, benign, uh, not so benign force, and the challenges that we're confronted with today. The book raises a profound um, question at the end, and, uh, I'm, and I, I'm, we are struck in sort of infinite rigorous, and I think that is very important. It has almost become obsolete in contemporary academic discourses, and it's very important that our imagination has uh, actually lost the force that it ought to have in dealing with issues like that. That is the idea of annihilation of caste. So um, may I welcome Professor, um, Professor Kilbil Garami to share your thoughts on the book. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to do this. I think this is a very fine and very important book. And uh, it's the only, so far as I know, book length monograph on, on the subject of caste panchayats. There, there's been an edited volume, but, but not a, a, a monograph on it. And uh, it's, a, it's a superb piece of work, partly because it is not only uh, got a lot of historical depth, but, but because it has a, a very clear and illuminating theoretical or analytical framework. And I think it's, uh, it's worth reading both for its theoretical insights and for the support, empirical support it gives uh, uh, by, uh, with a lot of historical uh, information and analysis. Now, one of the, I think it would be wrong to think of it as a book uh, about just caste panchayats. Uh, it, uh, Professor Ingele has a modest uh, manner of getting into the subject of caste, uh, which is through a very local uh, phenomenon such as the panchayat, caste panchayat, uh, but her canvas is much larger and is in fact it is an analysis of the phenomenon of caste in India over the centuries and, and should be on the same shelf as excellent books um, uh, such as for instance most recently Shumit Kuhas which is a, uh, a book that I've learned a lot from. Um, one of the one of the ways of coming to grips with what Professor Ingele has achieved in this book is to to read it as a response to a very very familiar and long-standing now for some decades uh, angle on caste. Uh, this is a, an angle which has been uh, dominated by a debate, uh, which really is a debate that arose out of a very, very and anthropologists who took issue with the remarkable influence of Dumont's work on caste. Uh, Shumit Guha's uh, book that I mentioned is only a very recent uh, entry into that debate, but this has been going on for a long time. It started with Srinivas and, and, and then there was uh, uh, the very influential work of Barney Cohen, which influenced people like Nick Dirks and others who, who wrote on caste and colonialism. And, uh, and then in, in work very much by people at CSDS, like uh, uh, Kotari and Dhirubhai Seth, and, uh, and theorists in my alma mater, one of my alma maters, which is the University of Chicago, the Rudolphs. <clears throat> All these people took issue with Dumont because they claimed that uh, caste should not be understood as a primarily religious phenomenon, it should not be understood as emerging out of a ritual order that was intrinsic to Brahminical Hinduism uh, with ideas of ritual purity and endogamy and so on, but rather it should be seen as, as an element, one element of a vast field of sociological reality. That's a 
a common phrase, sociological reality. <clears throat> and uh, it shouldn't be tied particularly to, to notions of ritual and Brahmanic and Hinduism. It should really be seen as a so social phenomenon with, uh, with a very early uh, role of the state and uh, state formation, how caste fed into it, how caste emerged out of it, and, uh, and therefore of politics right from the start. So Guha's view is that it's, it's politics is there right from the start. People like, like um, uh, the Rudolfs and Kothari tend to, to think of it as emerging, and, and Dirks think of it as emerging out of a colonialist uh, um, modeling of politics along a particular uh, set of lines. And, um, and Kotari and, and Virubhai Seth uh, from CSDS look particularly at the post-independence period and develop their views through a critique of modernization theory. Now, Professor Ingele's view is, is that this debate is, is in a way presenting something as a disjunction, whereas it really should be seen as a conjunction, a conjunction. That is, it isn't a matter of, of uh, ritual purity and authority on the one hand, and of politics and, and social and economic issues on the other, but they, they constantly fuse, feed each other, and, uh, and it would be foolish to to see them as, as uh, an either or. Uh, it should really be uh, by a conjunction, an and, that we, one should treat them. And the whole book is, does this in, and establishes this, I think, very convincingly by looking at things historically and taking up all the issues that people like Sumit Koha and others have done, uh, things like uh, the role of kings, uh, uh, the relation between kings and caste panchayats through intermediary sabhas, like the, uh, the Dharma of Rama Sabha. Uh, she looks at questions of military campaigns, of, of tax and revenue collections. So all the issues that the, these critics of Dumont stressed, she shows the extent to which caste panchayats and their socially conserving role of uh, appealing to, to textuality in, uh, uh, in the Hindu tradition and appealing to a whole range of methods uh, that, are, uh, that are very much tied to, to traditional uh, uh, strategies like uh, enforcing loyalty through social workouts and ostracization, etc. She sees them as genuinely conservative institutions, not to be equated with um, uh, with completely secularized uh, ideas of uh, de Turquil like voluntary associations and so on, which were. Uh, promoted uh, as the relevant category by people like the Rudolphs. And yet she, she does all this, looking at these conserving elements, these traditional elements, and seeing how they are absolutely shaped and constituted right from the start by politics of kings, of kingship, of, of, um, of military campaigns, of tax and revenue collection, all that through what she calls a long view, a long, uh, a long historical scrutiny of them. But of course, it takes a very specific turn in, in the, the modern period. Now, uh, uh, the chairperson has asked me to, to speak particularly on, on uh, uh, the modern period and, and she's, put a question to me just now, which, which I think is, 
is one of the theoretical insights in the book, um, which is, but one way to put it is this. Ambedkar was particularly talking about, about Dalits, but Ambedkar's general point can be made by a two very interesting and important strands in Ambedkar's thinking. One is that through his remarkable contributions to uh, constitutional issues in India, legislative issues, uh, and affirmative action policies. Ambedkar was surely the pioneer of affirmative action anywhere in the world. He, he was the first thinker uh, to, to promote the idea of affirmative action anywhere in the world. And so uh, there is that side of Ambedkar, which Ambedkar summarizes with the rhetoric of the empowerment of caste. So, so a whole range of affirmative action policies, uh, uh, whether in uh, the matter of jobs and benefits uh, or in the matter of uh, seats in the electoral field, uh, empowers uh, uh, the oppressed castes. He was focused on Dalits, but it's a perfectly general point. After Mandal, uh, uh, the field was, the canvas was, widen to other castes as well. But then there's this other side of Ambedkar, uh, which uh, Professor Engoli also mentions, which is the annihilation of caste. And one of the, the things that she develops in the second part of the book is that the way in which the empowerment of caste has proceeded through the period, it, of benefits and so on in post-Mandal politics uh, in India has been such, what she calls the Foucauldian biopolitics, which is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, what this culture of benefits and so on has done is created a certain role for caste panchayats in particular, which are enforced loyalties so that the benefits can continue to accrue. And she in detail shows how that is done by caste, caste panchayats. And, and the way it's done is such that it seems to be something that stands in tension with the idea of the annihilation of caste. That is the culture of benefits becomes a, 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 a something that, that has, that forces caste panchayats to, to retain caste identities so as to continue to get benefits. But if you have a framework of that sort by which the culture of benefits is, is um, dispensed for castes, then the annihilation of caste becomes a more and more distant goal. In fact, vanishingly distant goal. And so she says, this is a serious tension. And towards the end, she gives hints about why this is particularly so, because affirmative action, the culture of benefits is being done in a neoliberal political economy, which forces castes to compete with each other for these benefits. And she throws out various hints for how if it were not done within a neoliberal framework, but done within a more humane framework, uh, which was always intended by uh, welfare biopolitics, then there would be some scope for resolving this tension between uh, the annihilation of caste and empowerment of caste. Empowerment of caste would just be a stepping stone to the annihilation of caste, but that couldn't be done within a neoliberal framework within which affirmative action uh, culture of benefits is dispensed. It would have to be done in a much more uh, genuinely welfare and quasi-socialist uh, framework in which benefits are done. So that's where she ends and I completely agree with that and I have lots more to say on it uh, but but I'm going to cede the floor now to 
Professor Gopal Guru. Have you lost touch? Uh, you may engage with my question later, but maybe we should focus on Anaga's book now. The questions, uh, the themes that she raises. Oh. Uh, can you hear us? Do you asking me, Priya, Priya Darshini? Yes, sir, yes. Now, oh, should I start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please do. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, 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 thank you very much for this uh, invitation to share uh, the webinar with uh, Professor Akhil Vilgrami. Uh, I must thank uh, Nishikan for organizing this book discussion, uh, of which <clears throat> I wanted to be a part uh, very genuinely. Uh, I must also thank him for actually organizing, uh, taking this uh, initiative to organize discussion uh, on caste, and this actually fits into the tradition of discussing caste uh, uh, by Professor Rajin Kothari and Professor D.L. said, and Professor Bilgram has already made, made the mention to, made to this, these two scholars who actually uh, did wonderful work, seminal work on caste and politics in this country. Uh, Professor Bilgram has actually uh, uh, foregrounded the book in terms of the larger theoretical debates, sociological debates that actually happened before this book came into being. Uh, uh, maybe a decade or more than a decade ago. Uh, so uh, I must thank Professor Bill Grammy for actually having uh, laid down uh, uh, the framework within which I think uh, I have to also make some points as we are, as Professor Bill Grammy and I know that both of us actually wrote endorsement for this book. And so, uh, so to that extent, I think, uh, we will have to, uh, I am committed to actually say some good things about this book and also raise some questions in the, in, in, in the, in, 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 in the last section of my presentation. Uh, Professor Bilgrami used uh, two very important uh, uh, words, two expressions actually. One is the culture of benefits and welfare biopolitics. I think we need to do more on this. I think this is an invitation to do more on this. I don't think I'll come across but let's let's let us let us keep this aside as as a homework that Professor Wilgram has given to us. I think the book uh, is an important uh, contribution to the understanding of caste, uh, uh, caste and caste politics in India. Uh, and therefore, it's, it is needless to mention that the book is relevant simply because it deals with the theme of caste panchayat, topic that requires to be discussed frequently, as frequently as, uh, as, as the caste panchayat continues to cast its shadow on various spheres of society in contemporary time. It brings to our critical attention the complex relationship between caste panchayat, politics, patriarchy, state, and individual and community. These words are important and they actually find their res uh, reverberation resonance in all the chapters that form the part of this book. The, the book makes precise attempt to delimit the scope to seven thesis as Anaga has actually mentioned in our first very first chapter. And Anaga has chosen to organize the book around these seven thesis. And Professor Bilgami has already made the mention to that how this book is making a counterpoint to the thesis that is already given to us by established scholars right from Dumo onwards. So I don't want to repeat that. But the important point, one of the important thesis is that how far is caste important, caste panchayat particularly important in terms of uh, in terms of understanding the very framework of Hinduism. Uh, what role does caste panchayat perform in terms of perpetuating Hinduism? 
and then she is, is not giving a very clear answer to this question and uh, we'll have to ask her to give a clear answer because you know sometimes certain caste panchayats are hardly caste panchayats like denotified tribes in maharashtra rajasthan gujarat uh, they are not strictly speaking caste they are actually tribes um, but the panchayats are very very strong in these formations so uh, to that extent anagas point is well taken that caste panchayats may not really have very strong bearing on defining uh, uh, the very very framework of hinduism so what kind of hinduism we are talking about is it a, is it a, is it a folk hinduism or a brahmanical hinduism uh, or that uh, that that distinction has to be worked out uh, more clearly but the thesis is actually raising this very important counterpoint uh, to uh, uh, to to, uh, uh, to to actually foreground the exact uh, location of caste panchayat vis-a-vis -vis religion uh, the author rightly argues that the caste panchayats continue to enjoy both historically as well as in the contemporary times regulatory power and i think the bio, bio power comes here i think regulatory power that is extended over other spheres of society political legal economic state most importantly revenue uh, and gender and 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 she has actually done a, a very very competent work on the establishing real link between caste panchayat and these peers uh, the book brings to our attention a uh, caste panchayat that exists at the vertical level across different castes on the arrangement of hierarchy and also at the horizontal level within the caste that is to say caste panchayats are operating across the ladder and also within at the within within, within the caste system for example even in delhi there are caste panchayats which are actually uh, at work so that of course we uh, don't discuss uh, uh, but the book actually acquires courage to discuss this because we in our kind of being politically correct do not discuss what are the infirmities within the caste which are to, supposed to be subordinate caste so should we give them the concession she doesn't give and i don't want her to give the concession to we have to take them critically i think she mentions what is the role of critic in the in initial remarks the role of critic is to actually be objectively uh, honest in criticizing whatever is there you are tumbling on you are not looking for it so critic actually makes sense when you are tumbling on a reality or you are not looking for reality the moment you look for reality your critic actually loses this age so that uh, that care uh, anaga has taken so i actually completely agree with her caste panchayat refuses to go away as they are found to be important in gaining and maintaining control over power both in the immediate caste power uh, caste situation also as the abstract level in the larger political field of power consistency here deal state and rajni kothari are important reference points so this is one of the important uh, uh, themes that anaga is actually trying to deal with in, in the book the author brings to our brings out the distinction as well as the possible overlap between caste association and caste panchayat i mean there are there are references to it sometimes caste associations also actually collapse into caste panchayat and uh, and they also actually are uh, uh, at the lower heads at in other another context so that kind of a complex relationship between caste association and caste panchayat is brought out by uh, by anaga in her book Uh, the author assigns advantage to individual for gaining mobility uh, in in terms of caste association and considering the same mobility in terms of caste panchayat so that's the tension that the bilgram was referring to now so the uh, uh, so these are issues that we uh, uh, these are these are very important aspects of the book and uh, the book actually does uh, carries out discussion on several fronts and actually in terms of in in in, in terms of unfolding to us different dynamics that the caste caste panchayats actually are playing role uh, in in contemporary times 
I must also add here, she has a long discussion on Rudolph's and Dumo. Rudolph's discussion appears again and again. Now, she actually joins the issue with Rudolph's in terms of actually uh, treating caste association as something which is very, very democratic. And that has been the uh, thesis of Rudolph's, uh, that they are, actually, they, are, they, are, they are actually forcing, so to say, they're forcing caste associations, are forcing dialogue on tradition. In terms of in terms of actually within in terms of subverting from within the caste constraints, uh, that I think is an interesting point. But that happens only you are giving a modernist turn to caste association in terms of politics, democracy, legislative uh, representations, affirmative actions. All that happens, and that I think therefore, uh, uh, Rudolph's how this. Uh, uh, take on caste association and Anaga to some extent approves but also disapproves that to the extent that caste panchayas may not really give this leeway to achieve this mobility to uh, to individuals. So that, that that there is a very big discussion on this and that discussion itself is very important. Now I have a few points for Sibyl Grami and for Anaga to submit your kind consideration of further comprehension and interrogation. Point one. What is the method? I mean, that, I think the point I'm raising is, has some bearing on what uh, Professor Bilgrami and, and Priya you know, uh, were, were raising in terms of what, how do you actually resolve the tension between uh, caste panchayat uh, and annihilation of caste? caste association and annihilation of caste. If you actually take into consideration the culture of benefits actually moderated and mediated through caste, then how are you going to, are you not really prolonging and postponing indefinitely the agenda of annihilation of caste? That's the central question that uh, we have to deal with centrally. So in, in, in this context, I'm raising about four points in regard to your consideration. What is the methodological compulsion that could explain the existence of caste panchayat as a social category. That seems to be useful, useful in capturing a, and explaining an element of power exercised by patriarchy on the one hand and state and patriarchy on the other, across time and space, across time and space. So to put it differently, is caste panchayat a sufficient category to explain all the complex phenomena that keeps unfolding to our attention every every day, you have an answer. For you uh, supposed to you you are you are yet to give a full answer to this question. Why not other categories? Only why caste panchayat, caste association you have taken. Why not class category, for example? So can you not can you not really uh, can you not understand this? Uh, dynamics, social dynamics. Should we not really gain social insight into reality through, uh, through the category of class or other, other universal category? That's one methodological, is it a methodological compulsion to use caste as, as the only uh, possible category? That's one point. Point two, caste, for example, Kha Panchayat, and it's a related point. Or Maha Panchayat, all these panchayats are available to not only dominant caste, peasant caste, but they're also available to even Dalits. You have seen Jajjar, Hatras, we find that caste Dalits are also organizing caste panchayats against the atrocities committed on them by, 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 the, uh, by the dominant caste. Now the question is, do you, if this is the case, I mean, there are two, and the Khap Panchayat also is organizing itself, uh, organizing the members of peasantry against the three laws that the government has, has, has passed. So if that is the case, then do you want to throw the baby along with bath water? Can you really retry something which is there? I mean, this is the dilemma. The point that we have to then take into consideration, what is the inner organizing principle of any category, including caste Panchayat? And, and what is this external expression? There is a tension between essence and form I'm re referring to. And we have not been able to resolve this tension between caste and class debate, actually. The class wallahs are actually throwing 
the caste question, caste category unceremoniously, whereas caste fellows are throwing class unceremoniously. Can you really recover it? Can there be a, some kind of a uh, some kind of a, a epistemological, methodological move to actually reconcile them, or maybe uh, maybe you can use. Uh, uh, you can use caste as an initial condition of explanation and understanding. You can use caste as an initial methodological condition of explaining and understanding, but not the absolute and essential. You have to look for some other universal category. What is that? We were told that it is class. Yes, we were told that it is gender. Yes, but what are? How do you actually reconfigure this? is the real question. It's not simply a theoretical, methodological question, it is deeply political question. How do you reconcile these two at the level of practice and action? Uh, uh, and if you really, if you actually uh, follow one category at the cost of another, then you are actually running, or you might actually walk into the trap of essentialism. And I don't know, Professor Bilgrami uh, wrote an article uh, in Professor Raju Bhargava's uh, edited book on secularism and its critics. He's actually alerting us about his essentialism. And he says, and I don't know now, Professor Bilgrami is there, he will uh, 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 say yes or no to what I'm saying about him. That, you know, if there are no sound internal reasons available in a community or caste panchayat. From where do you get this reason, the sound reason for, for the kind of agenda you want to achieve? And therefore he suggests that you must get the reason from outside, maybe from the state, which is actually very, very, very sensitive, good, uh, ethically sound taste, not the autocratic or authoritarian or fascist state. Okay, this one option. The other option is you can always look for reasons coming from in public intellectuals. Or, and I'm just giving one example. Public intellectual also is a doubtful category these days. But you can always uh, uh, borrow from them <clears throat> some some help. And therefore, I think uh, you can avoid this trap of essentialism. And so I would really invite you to visit, go uh, find out the relationship between uh, individual, uh, 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 the, the, uh, between the, uh, the reason available. You might come, you might say there are people who say communitarians would always say there are some reasons already available in community. If they are there, the why are not they actually gaining grounds? Why they are not actually reining your sensibilities and cognitive capacities? That answer has to be uh, found out, uh, and this is to your consideration, Anaga. Uh, the last point, the very last point, I think, uh, I finished about 20 minutes? No. It's the okay. last point, then we get back to the author. Okay, no, I'll just last point. The author needs to go beyond the formal description of the social evil. I mean, the point that Professor Pilgrim was raising, and even Priyadashini also raised in her uh, questions to me that, uh, uh, I mean, you need to go beyond uh, analytical, because analytical, I mean, you can, your analysis can be fantastic, very, very agey and very, very sharp. There's no problem about it. And it can actually score some kind of advantage over the positions of the opponents. That is fine. And therefore, I think this analysis of caste panchayat may be very, very powerful and empowering because it is analytical. It actually goes into the causal relationship between uh, tax collection and caste panchayat function. But the, the social evil, such as social boycott you discussed at length in your last two chapters, is not simply punishment. It's a punishment, it's punitive in, its, in terms of its effect. But it's much larger than that. It causes much greater damage to your moral personality. That, you know, it, it inflicts almost civilizational violence by actually not 
by cutting off ties, linguistic, uh, communication, everything. Uh, you are not, you are un unapproachable, you are unseeable, you are, of course, untouchable. All that happens in this very, very intense boycott. This boycott, which is qualitatively different from the social boycott, boycott of clothes in during the freedom movement, all those boycotts are actually uh, much simpler forms of punishment. But the boycott used by caste punches against women, against the elite, particularly, and now against the minorities, is, is a civilizational violence. And I think uh, uh, it is much larger uh, uh, damage that we have to take into account. And I must, I must stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Inika, would you want to respond to all those uh, uh, questions, suggestions? Yeah. Right. So first of all, uh, I'm very grateful, of course, to CSDS and uh, Nishikar Ji for inviting me. And of course, to Professor Gopal Guru and Professor Bilgrami to uh, first for having read my book earlier and agreeing to uh, do this and for these uh, very incisive questions. Um, so rather than, uh, you know, jumping right into the questions. Uh, I think uh, it might be useful uh, uh, for others who are present and probably have not read the book to say that for me, uh, the book really began uh, from a correlation that emerged uh, in the field. Uh, and the, the correlation uh, that I'm talking about was that the majority of people who were facing this loyalty enforcement from their respective caste panchayats uh, came from castes that were beneficiaries of uh, what has been sometimes called the second wave of democratization. Uh, yet despite this democratization, that is the entry of these caste groups onto the political stage, whether in the form of being politically organized, being included in the affirmative action bracket, uh, caste members having local or state level political representation or being adept in uh, navigating through the political bargaining processes of the modern state as a collective, the dominance of uh, what are generally understood as primordial bodies, the caste panchayats over uh, group members seemed pervasive. Uh, and this correlation for me, of course, refuted the modernist assumption that uh, entry of caste into modern politics would completely dissolve the conservative aspects of caste. Uh, and my concern in this book has been loyalty enforcement, uh, social and uh, physical coercion. Uh, but the line of, line of questioning that uh, such a correlation encouraged uh, was whether caste conservatism was something that was uh, contingently present as a primitive sociological element of caste uh, despite or along with the parallel but independent uh, deepening of political democracy in India or the two were in fact uh, related. And my project in this book uh, has been to argue that the latter is true. So, so uh, that's basically uh, how I uh, began uh, into this uh, whole inquiry uh, from that began from caste panchayats, but then went on uh, to larger themes as uh, Professor Bilgrami has pointed out. Now, uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll now uh, use the time that I have to uh, respond to uh, the questions, uh, specific and larger theoretical questions that uh, Professor Gopal Guru has uh, posed. Uh, the first question uh, which was posed was about uh, how far caste panchayats uh, are important to understand Hinduism or rather what, what is the real relationship, how do we understand them. And uh, because there wasn't much work which was really available for me to look at caste panchayats, uh, the first question that I had to ask was, uh, is caste panchayat a political body? Uh, was it ever a political body? 
the historical uh, accounts uh, pointed to the fact that they were the present uh, data from the field pointed that they were so the question then was was there some point of time when they stopped being political bodies and that really uh methodologic it made it a methodological compulsion for me to look at them historically because uh, i really had to have the story uh, right in order to be able to say anything about uh, them analytically or theoretically so um, the relationship that these bodies have uh, with hinduism uh, really comes from that long view uh, that i take of uh, these panchayats and um, uh i have relied on secondary sources uh, so far as uh, uh, you know the period up to uh, let's say 1300 ce is concerned uh, and what appears uh, to be uh, the relationship is this so from the earliest records so we have uh, the first records in buddhist texts and uh, yajnavalka upanishadic literature uh, which basically speaks of a gramini who is a brahmin and this person is a village head but uh, yajnavalka then also goes on to speak about three kind of caste gods uh, the puga the shreni and the kula and the kula is the caste god uh, and every caste is supposed to have their own court etc shreni is the guild god uh, and the highest court is is the village court etc so uh, from that analysis though we don't really know how far these principles are integrated into all the other castes but uh, what we definitely uh, can say on the basis of the data that we have uh, is that from the period uh, after 1200 ce when the centralization begins so you have uh, the conquest of a lot of villages uh, and a uh, so, uh, a more centralized power in uh, kingdoms smaller kingdoms uh, that we have a institutionalized structure of the caste panchayat uh, framework so in, in which you have the royal court at the top the brahma sabha in the middle and uh, the caste panchayats uh, of particular castes down below and i think it is here that the real integration begins and uh, sanskritization then becomes a tool uh, that uh, favors both the caste and uh, the upper caste brahmins who are at the helm of these brahma sabhas who then sort of percolate uh, high vedic values uh, so that's when we have a hinduization uh, of these caste panchayats uh now what do i mean by hinduization so i would locate uh, three uh, sort of parameters through which i would say that caste panchayat seems to be getting hinduized first is uh, the ethic of uh, purity and pollution which gets uh, becomes part of uh, these panchayats so uh, because we are talking now not of inter caste but even intra caste pollution so members become polluted to their own caste and this is a sort of constant uh, threat of vulnerability that you can be uh, you know sort of uh, ostracized from your caste if you do not uh, follow certain strictures which are required of you so that's uh, that's the first uh, parameter the second is that uh, brahmins uh, become the gurus of these caste panchayats so uh the caste panchayats themselves lose control intra caste uh, at the intra caste level and it is the dharma sabha or the brahma sabha which is at uh, a higher level a matha or a pilgrimage center which gets to decide the uh, decide the cases because professor uh, gopal guru asked about the tribes uh, we see this percolation even uh, to uh, to tribes so for example uh, the nandiwala caste panchayat uh has uh, uh has a guru so you then cannot even resolve your own disputes caste disputes without uh, the intervention of uh, the brahmin guru and caste who cannot afford a brahmin guru will then have to become client of other uh, other lower brahmin caste gurus etc so that's the second parameter and the third is of course uh, the right to expiation which is uh, 
uh, done only by the Brahma Sabha. So uh, it is in this period that uh, I can for sure say that uh, you, we see that high uh, Vedic uh, and Brahmanical uh, standards are uh, imposed on these caste panchayats. So that's how uh, the relationship uh, seems to be from the historical record. And uh, a lot of these uh, purity pollution uh, principles seem to have continued. Uh, they have been picked up at certain points of time by castes who wanted to say that they're higher than uh, other castes in their vicinity. Jats have done this in Haryana because they don't want to give away their land to uh, the, the Chamar caste. And uh, they, uh, they, they want to uh, sort of establish that they are a higher caste uh, than uh, the Chamas, etc. So uh, we do see continuation of uh, uh, Hindu Hinduism and high Vedic uh, sort of principles of purity pollution continuing uh, and being adopted by caste panchayats. And uh, I think they were they happen uh, through the institution of this uh, system of the royal court, the Brahma Sabha, and the caste panchayat at the at, at the lowest level. So that's the period where we find. Uh, uh, that that it gets really integrated um now moving on to uh the question about uh the methodological compulsions uh to use caste uh, i mean i i began by saying as to why i uh got into uh this whole analysis of uh caste panchayats and uh the question of caste conservatism and why it persists in uh, in India's political democracy. I think to the extent that uh, speaking of uh, one's benefits uh, in, has become legitimate to a large extent only in terms of uh, caste groups. Uh, in India, in India's political democracy, uh, which uh, I have called uh, caste governmentality. It, I think caste has become a category which uh, one cannot uh, sort of ignore if one wants to think about Indian politics. Uh, and uh, to that extent, I think there is a compulsion to look at caste, but also to look at how exactly is it that uh, caste works. And I think uh, that has changed with time, over time a lot. And I have sort of tried to bring that out uh, as to uh, how, you know, the, the sociological life of caste as a category of uh, biopolitics through which the state imagines and operates the political culture of benefits uh, that has been, uh, you know, the sort of analytical uh, and theoretical goal that I have tried to uh, to push for. And uh, I think that the question of uh, why not class is, is very uh, interesting. And um, when I was initially uh, thinking of using uh, or in fact really trying to grasp uh, what what really was it that was the governing principle uh, to understand caste politics in the modern era? The choice of uh, the Foucauldian terms governmentality and biopolitics uh, were uh, obvious, but they were also tricky. They were tricky because uh, Foucault uses these terms in uh, to describe uh, a, a very particular kind of politics. So the welfare is politics that emerges on the basis of class for which the category uh, to, uh, to which benefits have to be accrued are class categories. Uh, whereas uh, what I was looking at were uh, groups who were uh, considered as historically oppressed. So we were speaking of social disability. So there was of course, uh, they were not the same things. Nevertheless, so far as uh, we have uh, 
not just in mandal but especially from mandal the state picking up a technology of uh, a rational bureaucratic approach of looking at uh, populations in terms of castes uh, drawing up markers and parameters of measuring their social backwardness economic backwardness educational backwardness fixing scores uh, giving score to each community on how they fare and then uh, you know deciding upon that uh, whether they should be included in uh, the list of benefits or not uh, that was how i uh, decided to use the terms governmentality and biopolitics nevertheless uh, i don't think the category of uh, class or is completely absent so who really benefits uh, from uh, having these uh, backward classes really obsess about quotas and caste and caste identity and i think the answer lies in the fact that uh, as we have the emergence of mandal since the 1980s we also have parallelly uh, liberalization of the state and uh, what that does is it it really hollows out the promise the ameliorative promise that could have been possible if uh, to which i think professor bilgrami uh, did refer which would have been uh, uh, possible if the state had not really moved out uh, all uh, possible resources benefits etc out of the public sector in which quotas work Uh, so i don't think class uh, really becomes uh, absent from the analysis as such but uh, because there is uh, a legitimization we just conclude in a minute or two we have to go to the other part sure 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 so uh, so far as uh, that remains in the background uh, class doesn't really become uh, so to say irrelevant uh but uh, it 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 is nevertheless uh, caste as a category uh, that becomes the locus through which uh, politics operates in the post uh, mandal era and uh, then sort of uh, you know boils down even outside quota politics to uh, local representation etc and and so on so um uh, i think i could stop here and uh, probably we could speak about the internal reasons in in the second part of the discussion and i think professor bilgrami uh, would be better suited to speak yeah. about it um yeah. anaga so what um, what we can do is that i'll i have a few questions for anaga and um, i have one question for the speakers all the speakers um first are my questions to anaga i know i have to also make a, a announcement to our virtual audience that if they have any questions they can go to the question and answer box and pose them there uh, anaga um, first let me congratulate you i think the hallmark of the book is a sort of effortless lucidity i'm really impressed by the clarity um, you bring in to and the depth that is accompanied you know i i think that's amazing task you know and i think everybody as professor bilrami was saying should have it on the shelf anybody is working on these issues you know it's not about caste it's about a much larger thing uh, what is fascinating for me is the fact that you take up caste panchayats which are much maligned and seen as something aberrant i mean every disclaims that is not the real hindu hindu caste phenomena feature it's an aberrant so you take that aberrant part and then you disclose it as the exemplary center i think that is amazing you have to, like the ways in which you uncover it and locate the different patterns the different manifestations the interconnections i think that is very powerful in your work and i think what makes this um, this possible this complexity this density is the fact that you are bringing in a sensorial material into your analysis and also a sort of very um, you know a fine reflexivity critical reflexivity into it of course a um, very uh, nuanced sensibility to which is very important and when there's a combination of this sensorial material and this um, deftness i think it's it brings in very different picture than we are used to in regular academic discourses and then again what happens as rightly professor bilgrami said it's not just about caste in the way we think about it is beyond that it's about the phenomenon of caste which becomes more palpable in your work 
That is important to me. But of course, there are going to be questions and there are going to be limitations like in all our works. So I'm going to uh, ask you a few, uh, you know, one or two questions. First of all, the long jury. You know, like um, one thing is that this work is especially about Hindu caste panchayats. I'm sure in non-Hindu caste groups, there are panchayats. And I would assume that a comparison of that form would have been helpful. And even if uh, in, a long, in a long jury section, you know, and the other question is about the nature of violence, uh, where uh, you tend to say, uh, referring to the uh, cup panchayats, that the kind of violence that is unleashed is a very new phenomenon, very different from that of the past, and actually unprecedented in recorded history. I'm not sure if this can be a justifiable argument in the sense that because much of folk history has been oral history. And we are not really, we don't have access to the text. So our knowledge of folk history is absolutely very limiting. You know, so unless we have access, more and more access to material, we can't really be sure about that. But you're right, in a sense, um, recorded history, we really don't have much information. But there's another substitute to that. Why do we forget that Vedic society has its tribal origins? So for me, that is an amazing example of that record of torture, violence, which is most unprecedented. If you may know the case of other adulterous women, the torture, the form of torture that is prescribed uh, for adulterous women. So for me, that is example of recorded history in a way, right? Um, so the other thing is about, about I think the most important uh, um, argument that comes is, I mean, the analysis, but, uh, the links that are developed between um, legal space, legality, uh, material interests, politics, I mean, there's a whole conjunction and it's an immense material. I mean, you won't, you don't need a lot of verbose words to explain that, you know, but I think the definite is there, you know. Um, but my, uh, uh, you know, queries, while you present this material, it tilts towards a sort of femininity that seems to me is characterized by motiveless passivity. I mean, for all the um, analysis that you have, motive is central to your argument. There's a, uh, there's a cause, there's a motive, there's an effect. I'm just wondering why this motiveless passivity when dealing with women's agency or subjectivity, both in case of Brahmanical patriarchy and the Kukkap Panchayat case. You know, that is one thing. And lastly, a question about sources. You know, the long jury thing you depend a, a, quite a bit on the Dharma Shastra tradition. What about the Niti tradition? Could have been, I mean, which could have been central to your, the, your formulations or the normative universe, or universe of statecraft, kingship, you know, administration. I think you do refer to Shukraniti. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I do assume I have read the book, but why not Arthashastra? So uh, this, uh, I think, um, are my general questions, but I'm come once, I mean, you will get um, another question from me along with other speakers, right? Uh, on, on the conclusive remarks that you make at the end of the book. So I think you can take over. I thank you, uh, Professor Priyadarshani, for saying the nice things and for these questions. Uh, so, um, about uh, I think the first and the fourth question are sort of related about the about the long view and uh, why only Hindu uh, caste panchayats, why limited sources, etc. So, uh, I, I sort of began this presentation by saying as to what really got me into uh, the inquiry. Uh, of caste panchayats. The question that I was troubled by was a political question and uh, I wanted to sort of limit myself to that inquiry. And the historical part, as I said, I went to only because uh, it was, it, it just wasn't there. So I had to uh, look for it. And I'm not a historian, nevertheless, uh, from uh, the sources that I could gather, I could uh, get my grasp on and uh, what I thought was necessary uh, for the narrative that uh, I, I, I had to recover for my inquiry. Uh, 
those were the sources that i limited myself to nevertheless i tried to look at the buddhist sources and uh, the shukraniti uh, etc and then of course when the secondary sources become uh, a lot more uh, solid i really relied on them so uh, i i really uh, do not have the training to go to the primary historical sources i'm not a historian and therefore uh, i didn't do that secondly of course it was a challenge to limit uh, the scope of the book uh, it it i did not want it to become a history book i don't think i can write one and uh, i don't want to interrupt you but you have to be a little quick we took three, three four minutes at the maximum because we would love to have a question and answer session with the audience sure so uh, yeah so that's uh, basically it and uh, the question about the nature of uh, violence uh, yeah so as, as as i think you yourself pointed out i it is clear that i'm violence recorded history will records etc yeah uh, to you. Uh, sorry to have interrupted you um, anika but of course we'll have many other occasions to discuss these things but my question to all the speakers is this anika's book i think reveals a fundamental paradox which we all in common sense knew that you know uh, Uh, we assume that ca- this politics is caste i mean caste based justice politics or uh, democratization caste based democratization this p- peculiar um, move in indian politics was just you know we were assuming that this there is a goal that is just deferred it is there it will happen in some time uh, it takes a time maybe but it's likely to happen it, it has just be, it has been just deferred but anika says and rightly so that it it is not a deferral but it's antithesis it is antithetical the politics that we have now caste based politics or uh, post modernization and given the liberal st- uh, new liberal state and the kind of politics that is built around it um is act- actually the uh, imagination of probably a caste less society or radical transformation has really no take as now so that is one thing but this is there it's not a deferral but it's actually antithetical the politics that we are preoccupied with is actually not um, actually going towards that um, route uh, but this raises a fundamental question the nature of politics and the agenda of transformation and the resources that we have for such an imagination transformation of society if i make this argument if caste is integral to hinduism it is a caste phenomenon i mean it is a religious phenomenon and there is a continuous history it still happens of violence caste violence yet i think there is this i mean an academic separation between caste violence and religious violence i mean it works as a sort of lurking fallacy in uh, you know academic discourses discourses where there's a decoupling of caste and secular the caste transformation project and the secular project this i think these are going to two different routes there is no convergence it is as i see them why i mean um, first is it that there is an anxiety i for me for my mind it means it seems that there is an anxiety at two levels at the level of imagination and theorization or academic anxiety of contaminating the pure purity of indian model of secularism possibly that that's that's what i think it is and the other anxiety seems to stem from um, politics the majority in politics the, this um, anxiety is intrinsic to hindu majoritarianism so for me um, the question i ask to you is that given this decoupling of caste transformation and secularism the secular project what resources need to be actually brought in for bringing the two together looking forward to a more democratic secular society both in ter- terms of intellectual imagine um, resources we have within and outside and the ways in which we can imagine a politics as anaga says which needs to be really move it, it has to be a radical move from the present politics that we are entangled in it. so my um, i'll go first to professor uh, akil bergrami for this and then professor gopal guru and then anaga Uh, could you switch on the um, um, audio? Uh, uh, Gopal has raised a couple of points that I think should be addressed, and let me just do it quickly and and try and represent uh, 
Anagayangala's uh, view on it. You see, uh, one of the things that one should look at is to what extent is the very existence of caste panchayats in the form they take a failure of a whole range of, of secular institutions. Uh, one is just uh, the uh, institutions of Panchayati Raj. If the Panchayati Raj was actually functioning as it was ideally um, envisioned to do, uh, then there wouldn't be any need for what uh, caste panchayats uh, are doing. So I think one approach should be, what were the failures of the relatively secular institutions that were developed? Panchayati Raj, criminal courts, and so on and so forth. Um, why were they, uh, what were the shortcomings such that uh, caste panchayats did not disappear in the way that modernization theorists thought they would, in the way that Rudolf and Kotari and so on thought that uh, they could be understood in uh, voluntary association, the, the uh, Tuckvillian terms and so on. So, so there's a whole range of questions to ask. What were the shortcomings of a whole range of institutions like Panchayati Raj institutions and criminal courts, civil courts of that kind. Uh, they, they must have failed in some sense, and that needs to be analyzed. The second point I want to make is that, you know, there's a, a long tradition of, from Kosambi, Irfan Habib, um, Shumit Guha is a latecomer in this tradition, and, and this tradition points out or takes a certain line on, on the origins of caste particularly. And so for instance, you might say, if you were committed to this line, which in many ways is a very attractive line, you might say, look, take Dalits in particular, you know, they, you could take the view that historically they were not defined by some impure function in a ritually characterized order. They were hereditarily unfree agricultural laborers, which were almost in a slave-like status. Right? So you could take that view, and it would be a view which, which says that even in, you know, those what, wet rice growing areas of the heartland, where Brahminical Hinduism is supposed to be most entrenched, well, this is a different way of looking at it. They, they emerged in a different way. So the genealogy of caste and so on can be given um, an account which is, doesn't depend on purity and rituality and, and so on. But the what Anaga Engule is doing is to say, but I want to come to a slightly different view, which is not as if it doesn't recognize the importance of class to use Gopal's uh, claim, but rather points that if you look at the sociological reality, caste panchayats have a socially conservative or conserving role that they've played from very early on, and she traces it empirically, historically. And the point is it, is, it is proof that Hinduism is caste and caste is Hinduism in some respect. And, in, in a, and she spells it out through the lens of the existence of this institution, caste Punjab. Now, the interesting thing is that by the time you come to the modern period of biopolitics, uh, the well, ideas of welfare, uh, of continuing life, continuing life without pain. Remember, biopolitics comes from the idea that we must preserve life and we must avoid pain. Things that go back to, to people like Bentham and so on. And that, that, that is an essential part of politics, of populations who must be, who, whose life must be preserved and who must be kept relatively free of pain through the institutions of benefits, welfare, uh, health, education, and so on. Okay, now the, the question is that uh, Gopal raised is an interesting question. He says, what about the much larger effects of things like ostracization and so on? Look, and that is absolutely true. And this goes back to Gopal's own work on humiliation and so on. There is a psychology of caste oppression, which is not going to be affected by anything to do with political economy and issues of welfare and so on, right? So, I mean, just, just the other day, there was this long report on, on Ur Panchayats in Tamil Nadu, 
where so, so, some caste was completely humiliated uh, by, by the dominant caste, the Vanir caste, made to, to genuflect and supplicate themselves in front of caste elders just because they'd organized a festival without getting the permission of, of, uh, uh, of the caste elders of the Urpanishad. It, this is nothing but humiliation, right? And so it has, the, the, there's a whole psychology around caste oppression and the role of caste panchayats in it, which has got to do with these large civilizational effects, moral psychological effects of humiliation, etc. that Gopal has written about, Ashish Nandi and others have. But nevertheless, I think what Ingole is pointing out is that in a period of biopolitics, when you have benefits accompanied by a political economy that can only be described in, in, in summary terms, let's say, I don't have the time, it, a neoliberal, uh, then there is a sense in which she is committed to the, to the central category of class because she's pointing out that that is why that notion of biopolitics, the notion of welfare, the notion of affirmative action, all of these things, just are not given what they were intended to have. In the post-1945 period with the Beveridge Report, where biopolitics was generated through notions of welfare, it was done with a view where it was just assumed that capital would not, capitalism was not, did not take the form that it now takes, the neoliberal form. Right? And within that within that conception of it, we, we don't have that conception that post-mundal politics, where there's biopolitics, is, does not, has, has never had that framework, which was intended initially by the Beveridge Report in welfare politics. So she's speculating about what would it be if there was not a neoliberal framework, but another framework in which this would happen. And to, to speculate that is to make class central. That's as she pointed out. And, and I think that, uh, that that speculation is something that ought to be elaborated in theoretical terms. And, and uh, the, the book has the virtue of making the beginning of uh, uh, taking the beginning steps of doing that. Okay, I'm gonna stop now. Thank you, Gopal Guru. Professor Gopal Guru. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Whatever Professor Bilgami has uh, said is good enough to really uh, throw enough light on the questions that are raised. But two quick points, just so time. Uh, one is that why it is, uh, uh, why it is not deferral but antithetical. So that's the question between the caste politics and emancipation, emancipatory project. But from where do you get the resources to actually undermine caste politics, convert it into some kind of universal secular politics? So Bilgami was actually <clears throat> pointing out to the failure of the liberal institutions, criminal courts, Panchayati Raj, you know. And I think it is very true. Uh, this was the fact we have uh, Tanta Mukta Gao, I mean Bakeda Mukta Gao, as they say, uh, social tension, free villages and all the new things are coming up. And Maharashtra government has actually adopted these, uh, but they are actually not uh, yielding any, any good reason. The question is, you know, why these liberal institutions fail in terms of uh, uh, not forcing the maturity of tensions in caste panchayat? Why limits of caste panchayats were not actually allowed to mature and get finally exposed? Uh, is there a, some kind of a conjecture between conjecture, conjunction between uh, liberal institutions? Uh, I mean, liberal institutions within courts and caste panchayats. So just to give a rhetorical answer to this, you know, there is a parallel constitution happening in the society. Uh, and that they say it's a Manuwadi constitution that actually happens in the society. So uh, uh, to what extent have we been able to actually achieve some kind of mass internalization of secular values that are enshrined in the Indian constitution? Whose actually duty is this to really look for emancipation? Uh, more secular kind of society that we will have uh, I mean, you have to liberate yourself uh, from this some kind of a Sanskritization and Sanskritization can, I, mean, I actually hate using Foucault, but, <clears throat> you know, there's a, in Foucault's power, uh, there's a concept of power relay. 
what is it sanskrit is nothing but power really i mean you were i mean i don't know whether uh, uh, the, the 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 caste panchayat norms were internalized by the tribals it may be other way around amega i'm quite sure about it <clears throat> so uh, so the deferral has to be uh, uh, deferral has to be understood in terms of its liberal space and liberalism has a bounded duty to actually if it is a genuine liberalism has a bounded duty to undermine the the, the, the fangs of caste uh, caste panchayat uh, so uh, but that liberalism i mean i'm talking about this stage theory anyway so that task of taking liberalism seriously has not been actually exhausted in our country and that's why you find uh, pre mod pre modern or primordial i mean if you are using primordial primordial categories like caste panchayat because as long as they are serving the political interest they will be useful and relevant all the time caste panchayats have become permanent interest in politics these days so who should take care of this is the question and we have to actually go to the people because uh, politicians have no i mean some certain kinds of politicians have no interest mm. uh, uh, so this is one quick uh, 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 quick response to what priyadarshini was uh, uh, talking about so i'll i'll stop here yeah thank you yeah anika you want to respond to that Uh, yeah very quickly to the uh, question posed by you professor priyadarshini about uh, caste politics the way it is today uh, not really uh, serving a deferral but being antithetical to uh, annihilation uh, i think that's sort of the central idea uh, of the entire analysis that i've made and uh, I, the whole argument at least I, what i've tried to say in the book is that Uh, the way caste governmentality operates today no uh, i was citing you anaga i was just saying i was reiterating that it's your point that's the insight that we get from your book i agree agreeing with you on that right so if i can i take uh, half yeah, a sure, minute sure sure go ahead go ahead right so i think uh, to look at things this way makes uh, bringing in uh, the idea of annihilation Uh, to the center stage of how we should think about caste politics, and I think that is something uh, that needs to be worked upon. I'm, I'm. Uh, this is like an aspirational uh, idea that I've introduced. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. So I think we we can take um, one or two questions from the audience. Um, which one? So. Uh, there is one question what about dalit women situation in caste panchayat adaka could did you hear could you hear me yes uh what about the question of what about dalit, dalit women women's caste situation in caste panchayat right so so far as intra caste panchayats are concerned uh there is incidence of caste panchayats across all uh you know sections of uh of the caste society including dalits and uh, the situation of uh, dalit women in caste panchayat is uh, more or less similar to a uh, situation of women in other panchayats so they are not supposed to sit in these panchayats they can't be leaders they are not even members they can't be witnesses etc and uh, there's there are also incidences where uh, they are punished uh, most heavy uh, you know uh, heavy handedly with a lot of violence for things like adultery etc and endogamy uh, seems to be Uh, a central concern for these panchayats so so if uh, i were to give an example uh, a young uh, woman who was uh, from the navbuddha caste was punished because she uh, earned a scholarship which was named uh, after dr baba saheb ambedkar by her community because she sort of broke the caste rules etc so uh, it it doesn't seem to be very different from the way it is in other castes anicha jaya or or niche ha this is a question to uh, professor akil bilgrami caste panchayats based on caste system in india are caste specific juries of elders um, of four villages generally they are distinct from village panchayats 
um, in that the later I statutory. But do you think that caste panchayat in India is the supremacy of Hindu patriarchal Brahminical institutionalism, which was imposed on the subaltern social groups? I don't know if you want to take that. But if you want to, please go ahead. Well, I think that Ananga should, should uh, uh, respond to that. This is her subject and, and her book. I mean, I have views on it. Much of them are influenced by Anagar's work. Um, so I'll cede the floor to Anagar on that. Would you want to go um, respond to that, Anagar? Sure. Can you please repeat the question? Actually, I think that you have already written about that in your book. And uh, yes. if the person wants to read, he should go to the book and get it. You know, it's a repetition. I think, I mean, um, we would, because we just have three minutes left, you know, so I think we have to wind up this uh, session. But um, uh, thank you so much to all the participants. This was, I think, um, I look forward to more uh, sequel uh, of this kind. And um, I do look forward to another book from Anaga. I think um, uh, I'm equally interesting and insightful. Uh, may I ask my colleague Nishikan to give a word of thanks? Um, thank you, Dr. Vijayshri. So the second task was assigned to me by the chair to propose the vote of thanks uh, because as uh, chair also said we have a lack of time so i will um, i will thank only whom i can see here in person and i thank because to organize such thing many people work work for, work um, so i will uh, thank them in general so first i will like to thank professor gopal guru and professor akhil bilgrami for uh, for being an interlocutor or uh, panelist for this workshop i always inspire your work even if i have not met you in person your work is there to inspire uh, like me me and like many other uh, other gener generations so i really thanks both of you for, uh, for for your support encouragement and participation I also like to thank uh, Dr. Anga Ingole for writing this very important contemporary book, and I hope it will generate a very, a very powerful debate in, in India, and it will, it will, it will inspire other also to uh, write write uh, such important books and engage with that. And, uh, and I also like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Vijay Shri uh, for agreeing on my request to chair this session uh, and I really thanks her, uh, her and I also like to thanks uh, Ayodhya for providing all these technical supports and I also like to thanks all the participants attendants who participated actively and listened and benefited like me in, in this workshop. I also like uh, to thanks everyone at, at the CSDS uh, for for helping in one or another way to organize this workshop. And I also want to thank myself also that I have taken this initiative and uh, and I hope I will I will trouble you more again and again. I have already written one uh, for um, one another talk to one professor, most probably we will have and surely we will have such more event. Thanks to everyone. If there are any error or mistakes that are mine, thank you. Thanks, everyone.